Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is seven o'clock on the last Saturday of the month, and um, welcome to yet another edition of the Avis Money Curation. So, uh, my name is Avis, and um, there is Vani. Hello, people. We are the Happiness Wallas. Our life's purpose is inspiring happiness. Google us, H-A-P-P-Y-N-E-S-S-W-A-L-A-S, Happiness Wallas. Uh, we are um, having a good, uh, interesting story to share. Um, if you Google us, you'll find more about it. I'm having some problem with the way these, the screen is displayed, so I'm getting distracted. Uh, but let me come back to what I was beginning to say. Uh, we're going through a very uh, interesting phase in our life. In fact, for the last uh, 14 years, 14 plus years, we've been dealing with a uh, crippling bankruptcy. This means uh, for a very long time, uh, we've been living uh, through long spells of worklessness and often uh, pennilessness. Uh, this, um, this has meant that uh, our material life is very broken, uh, completely ravaged, in fact. And uh, there are uh, social, emotional, legal, uh, of course, financial, uh, professional, and physical challenges that uh, we're coping with. Uh, in this dark time, however, of our life, um, spread over um, 14 plus years, uh, Pani and I discovered something magical, something very beautiful. We realized that um, our uh, ability to cope with the crisis really depended on how uh, we were going to respond to the situation. So early on, way back in the end of 2007, when all this started, um, we um, kind of um, intuitively uh, uh, decided that we had to last course. This meant that uh, we had to learn uh, how to deal with the situation on a day-to-day -day basis. So we trained our mind to be uh, non-worrying, non-frustrated, and non-suffering. So when you are, uh, uh, you know, choosing not to pick up worry, we discovered that, uh, you know, worries basically fall into two buckets. Uh, problems that you can solve, uh, why worry about them? Uh, uh, so don't worry about problems that you can solve. And problems that you can't solve, uh, which you can't solve, uh, why worry about them? So uh, either way, uh, worrying is futile. This is what we discovered. And we learned the art of being non-worrying. We realized also that we only have a right to our actions. We do not have a right to the outcomes. Um, two plus two in life does not add up to four. So uh, sometimes. So you may be talented, you may work very hard, but you cannot achieve worldly success. Uh, and so you must train your mind to be non-frustrated. That's the second thing, second quality that we kind of imbibed. We trained ourselves to, to develop this quality. And the third quality that we uh, developed is the ability to be non-suffering. Uh, you know, pain in life is, uh, uh, is, uh, it, it is inevitable. It comes uninvited. And the way it comes is uh, it comes with, uh, with a mind of its own, uh, with a decision perhaps to stay for a certain tenure, and it's non-negotiable. But we make the pain unmanageable as human beings by asking, why is the pain there in the first place? We, we ask ourselves, why is the pain there in the first place? And why should I have to go through that pain? So why and why me? When you drop these two questions, when you stop asking these two questions, then despite the pain being there, you don't suffer. So you, you learn to be non-suffering. So we, we learn to be non-worrying, non-frustrated, and non-suffering. And through that process, we discovered the art of being happy despite our circumstances. That was like a eureka moment for us. And we, uh, uh, we, we asked ourselves, Vani and I, how can we share this learning with others? Uh, how can we be useful to a larger segment of society. 
you know, we are, we were not being successful. We're still not successful. We still don't have enough to cover living expenses <clears throat> month on month. Uh, so uh, it's a very excruciating, dark, debilitating phase of our life. So success to bahut dur ki baat. It's a, you know, being successful in a worldly sense seems to be elusive for us, but we could still be useful, we thought. And so in um, in 2014, uh, we, um, we, we explored this, this question, how can we be useful? And that led me to write my uh, book, uh, Fall Like a Rose Petal, which was published in um, August uh, 2014. In 2019, uh, the Tamil translation of this book, Udirum Roja Idar Pola, uh, translated by the legendary uh, Tamil writer Charu Kesi, was released. Uh, so both books are available on Amazon and uh, publishing this book, telling our story uh, and um, delivering talks around this gave our life a sense of purpose. Uh, we, we started looking at life uh, as, as a meaningful opportunity despite our, our very challenging dark phase. And uh, the other thing we did was we retooled our, our business and we uh, are today a uh, a, a boutique consulting firm that um, uh, explores and distills lessons on life and happiness from human stories uh, to inspire managers to high performance. This, um, uh, you know, gave, gave our life um, a more direction, uh, more focus, and a great joy in being able to do these, uh, the, uh, uh, these, these uh, programs in the uh, in, the, in the corporate space. And the third thing that we did was we started uh, conversations uh, in the public space, free, reflective, non-commercial, live conversations um, centered around the idea of happiness. This meant that um, we, were, um, we would invite people who are, um, uh, you know, having interesting stories to tell and hold conversations. Uh, the first of these conversations called Bliss Catchers is, uh, is, a, is a conversation that um, focuses on uh, people who have gone on to do what they love doing the most in life. And uh, uh, the second conversation series, the Happiness Conversations, which is the one that you are joining us for today, looks at the lives of people who have every reason to be unhappy. Uh, they are going through a crisis like one in, or they've endured a very dark and challenging phase of their life. And yet they have uh, discovered the art of being happy despite their circumstances. So these two conversations further gave uh, us uh, meaning and a sense of purpose. Uh, and that's why we say inspiring happiness is our life's purpose now. Uh, to introduce today's session of the happiness conversations, um, let me um, um, go to Javed Akhtar. Um, I, was, I was telling Vani, um, you know, it may be a nice idea to talk about what Javed Akhtar wrote for uh, Zindagi Na Milegi Do Bar. Uh, actually, um, uh, not Zindagi Na Milegi Do Bar. I'll choose this one for introducing the session, which is Kal Ho Na Ho. What he wrote for Kal Ho Na Ho. Shankar Asan Loy wrote the music. Sonu Nigam sang this iconic song pictureized on Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, and uh, the, the line goes like this, Har ghadi badal rahi hai rup zindagi. Chao hai kabhi, kabhi hai dhup zindagi. Har pal yaha, ji bhar jiyo. Jo hai samaha, kal ho na ho. So what, what the poet is saying here is that life is constantly, continuously changing its form, its shape, its hue. And uh, th there are times when what you want happens in your life and you get everything that you want. And there are times when which are torrid and uh, challenging. Uh, so you never know which way life is going to turn. So don't uh, postpone happiness. That's what he means. That you never know where, whether the same environment that you are in will be uh, uh, there tomorrow or not. So. Celebrate what you have, enjoy what you have. And that is the primary message that uh, the poet is giving in this, uh, in, the, in this song. And that is the essence of the happiness conversation. We talk to people 
who have faced life despite the odds. You see, everyone has a, a challenging situation in their life. Somebody is dealing with a health challenge, we are dealing with a bankruptcy, somebody has lost a loved one, somebody is dealing with a relationship challenge, somebody has lost their job. So I, there, there, is, there is no problem-free individual in this world. But most of the time, when a problem hits us, uh, people get uh, shocked. People get numbed by it. They feel lost. They feel clueless. And um, over time, they learn to uh, understand that by resisting the problem, by fighting it, uh, they are not going to solve it. Only by facing the problem, only by understanding that uh, this is the process of life, that what goes up comes down and what go comes down goes back up again. Only by understanding the process of life can you deal with the problem better. The guests that we have featured in seven seasons of the series, uh, 21 editions so far, uh, 36 guests so far, they've all uh, kind of learned uh, in their own ways the art of being happy despite their circumstances. This series celebrates their journeys. And today uh, we have um, the young, um, always smiling, full of life, uh, journalist, um, Parvati uh, Bindu Benu with us. Uh, she uh, has uh, uh, has her own story, uh, which um, you know we will be exploring uh, in a bit. And so, thank you, Parvati, for joining us. Uh, we we really appreciate it, Bani and I, that you could um, be with us today. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we discovered her story and how she is on this uh, show. But before that, let me go to my uh, to our audience, we have a we have an intimate, tiny audience today. Uh, some people I understand are joining from, uh, you know, someone is there from Erode. I saw somebody, uh, of course, people from Chennai and Bengaluru, uh, from Hyderabad, from Jodhpur, and uh, someone is joining us due to join us from Canada. Uh, so uh, we, we have quite, and someone from Kochi. So uh, we, we have a diverse audience, but an intimate one. Um, and just uh, so that you, you all know how this works, how this conversation works, uh, we, we started on time. We go all the way till 8.30 between uh, Vani, me, and Parvati. And um, uh, we will end sharp at 8.30. Uh, the audience will be placed on mute all through uh, the evening. Uh, we will not be responding to uh, any raised hands or, um, uh, or, or to your comments, but please keep your comments and thoughts coming in the chat box and we'll pick them up after the event is over. Um, thank you for turning off your videos. That gives us extra bandwidth to, uh, you know, to record this conversation which I'm doing. Avani and I, uh, we are um, on two different devices uh, uh, and we are, um, you know, on two different networks. Uh, so if one of them uh, has an internet outage, the other one will be there to uh, pick up the conversation and take it forward. Our building is also um, backed up with 24-hour um, uh, power backup. So in case we have a situation where there is a power outage, we'll be back uh, quickly. Uh, so please bear with us um, if that should happen. Um, uh, enjoy the conversation. This, this is a conversation where um, we will be exploring part of the story, but Vani and I will also be sharing notes from our own journey in our life. And... Therefore, uh, there may be something that um, may strike a chord. There may be something that is relatable. And so you may want to pick it, pick it up from here and take it away. Or there may be, you know, you may, you may just find it an interesting conversation and nothing, um, nothing that you can take away. Uh, but, but, but that's fine because uh, it, these are personal journeys. And uh, while life happens to all of us differently, there are times when uh, we can draw lessons that are applicable uh, to everyone. So that's what we are trying to do here. Um, on that note, let me talk a little bit about Parvati and then get this conversation started. So how do we know Parvati? Um, a couple of years ago, uh, not a couple actually, four years ago, uh, uh, Vani and I uh, worked on, a, on an assignment at the New Indian Express where Parvati was working and produced work there. And uh, we saw in her um, a, a young lady, full of life, cheerful, uh, very dynamic, 
and extremely warm uh, and uh, friendly uh, at all times. During, during the few months that uh, we worked um, uh, on, with the team at the New Indian Express. And um, we kind of you know, came away feeling good, having interacted with many people, but Parvati's uh, smile stayed with us. And uh, uh, her, uh, you know, her, her very effervescent nature uh, stayed with us. We had no idea of what she was facing possibly exactly around that time in her life. And when we heard it, uh, it was actually through the newspaper itself. She wrote a first person account of uh, dealing with uh, mycosis fungoid, a rare skin cancer uh, in the Chennai Express and that appeared, I think, Parvati, July of 2019, if I'm not wrong. And uh, that gave us, um, uh, you know, gave me and Vani a deep insight into how evolved this young lady is. Uh, just reading that piece, that here's somebody that was going through all of this when we were interacting with her in the New Indian Express, but she showed no signs of it uh, in, in our interactions. So we reached out to Parvati and said, hey Parvati, we want to do a conversation with you. Would you please, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, Accept our invitation to be on happiness conversations, uh, and she she signed up. But because our conversations are um, forward curated, it took a little while to uh, you know kind of slot it and schedule it, and finally we are being able to do it now. So it's taken like a couple of years to actually get this happening. So thank you, Parvati, for a accepting and b be, being patient with the process. Um, uh, uh, Parvati uh, has been dealing with a situation. For the last 20 years, uh, this is the story of a young girl and her family who, who discover white scaly patches on her skin and think it's something that will go away, but it doesn't go away. Um, she goes through much of her teenage trying to try different treatment uh, methods. Um, uh, at least one of them left her uh, with very low self-esteem. And uh, she, during this process, she had to do, uh, deal with lot of social stigma and uh, at one point she had resigned to her fate that she was going to live this way for the rest of her life and then comes um, uh, the, the shock, the shocker which is that uh, you know a friend recommends uh, her to a, a dermatologist who diagnoses her with uh, mycosis fungoid, a rare uh, skin cancer. We'll talk a little bit about what that is uh, actually in a, in a while. Uh, and uh, obviously, when you hear the C word, you, you, you don't know how to process it. And uh, fear of death, uh, the, the whole uh, thing that um, you're in a situation where uh, you cannot uh, find a way out. So the darkness kind of engulfs you. All of that Parvati went through. But now today, at, um, you know, at 27, she is, uh, the cancer is in remission and she is, uh, uh, her usual self, uh, cheerful, uh, full of life. And we want to really understand what she has gone through. How did she face all of this? And how she has built her career as a journalist while doing all of this, while dealing with all of this, and yet uh, never let her spirit, uh, you know, uh, kind of come crashing. Uh, she sustained that spirit, that positivity. So that's really the exploration for the evening. Thank you once again, Parvati, for, for joining us. Um, are, you, are you all set? Are you, uh, are you feeling yeah, good? Yeah, all good, all good. Good to go. Good to go. Okay, so over to uh, Vani to take this uh, forward from here and I'll keep joining. Yeah. Uh, so Parvati, um, the question uh, foremost on everyone's minds and uh, therefore I want to bring it up first is the scientific question. Uh, could you tell us all what um, uh, mycosis fungoids is all about? Uh, just tell us the, the scientific explanation of what it is and so that people you know, understand what you're going through. Okay, this is perhaps the only scientific question that I've been answered in my life. <laughs> so, uh, 
Yeah, so uh, mycosis fungoid bat uh, is a very rare kind of lymphoma that, you know, uh, so, okay, so it's a kind of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So here, the T cells in your body that are actually supposed to, you know, protect your immune system, they decide to not do their job and actually attack you, actually attack your immune system. So mycosis, wow. mycosis fungoid is a kind of cutaneous T cell lymphoma and that is what I have. Um, and in my body, it was apparently shown as white patches. And thankfully, I was diagnosed at a very early stage when it only stayed on my skin and did not you know, seep into my bone marrow or uh, create any more compl complications. So it was at a very curable stage when the diagnosis happened and you know, that is that is luck, I believe. Yes. So yes, in and layman's term, that's what it's all about. Right, right. And but when these things first started appearing on your skin, you were pretty young when you first noticed these. How? So tell us something about how it felt and how old you were when you first yeah, noticed. So, it. Right. So um, let's say I was I was in say class three or four when my mother um, you know noticed something like there was a discoloration on the skin in a couple of places so she didn't know what it was because it, that that's the age when you know you see a lot of children with calcium or vitamin deficiency when they develop a lot of these infections and things so they thought it's one of those things we went to a dermatologist dermatologist gave a medicine and it would go Sometimes it would go away and then it would come back again. So that sort of uh, went on for a while. As in, uh, like, yeah, I was almost eight years old when it appeared for seven, seven and a half, probably. And uh, then every time I think that, you know, this would go away, um, but it somehow did not go away. It just stayed on. And... That was around the same time when we switched countries. I think from India, we went to Qatar, my family. So right. then there was a phase where uh, things would be all good when I'm in Qatar. And then I'd come back to India and it would reappear. They, they began to wonder, like, what, what is with India? Or rather, what is with Kerala that's triggering this? Because things are fine in Qatar. Then... Uh, uh, in fact, things were fine until, you know, uh, we were in Qatar because I, we lived there um, until my class 10. And the summer, the, the summer of 2009 was when we came to India for a holiday. And at that time, a patch on my right arm, that sort of blew up. And it was very, very, very light. Uh, and all of a sudden, the paleness started increasing. It was very white, it was rough, and it was quite noticeable, especially on the skin of a, um, you know, obviously I'm not a fair person. Uh, my skin tone is quite, uh, is, I mean, I have a brown skin, so that was quite noticeable. And people would ask what it was. And uh, I mean, honestly, none of us had an answer. I did not have an answer. My mom didn't know what to say. Nobody knew. So uh, that's how it went on. And it's only so in, uh, I mean, after my class 10, that was in 2000. So I just, I just want to, sorry for interrupting you, but uh, I think when you are so young, you know, you were hardly eight or 10 when you, when it first started manifesting, you don't realize it because you're a child and you, you probably did not even know that hey, I have a medical condition and this is like probably something you probably thought, okay, this is something and it's getting triggered by atmospheric something in the, you know, India when you move from Qatar to India and so on. And so this is probably just going to go away and, and stuff like that. But eventually, uh, like you you arrived at the time, right, when you're this so-called something on your skin actually got a medical uh, you know, name to it, a kind of a diagnosis, if I may, which somebody came up with. And, and so so what happened after that? I mean, you were just talking about how you came to class 10 and then, you know, uh, 
maybe you you actually came to a diagnosis was that what happened uh so no there was no diagnosis until say 2010 nobody gave a name to it except nobody gave a name yes. white patch no 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 there was no <laughs> name <laughs> but again you know uh yeah where was i 2010 yes when we moved to india so uh that was around the time when uh, again this passage was quite evident and in india we have an interesting lot of people who you know even if you want to forget something they'll constantly remind you and tell you unpleasant things right in your face and just make it look make it seem like they're being very concerned but in reality they know they just they just they just say this they like to see other people sad so right. you know we'll see it's concerned aunties and uncles like oh my god what happened what's that thing Oh, you're not taking any medicine. Is it not going to go away? So I, I was quite young. I didn't know what to say. So yeah, it, obviously, eventually, you know, I thought, what's the best way to hide? Maybe like wear long sleeves, or that's sort of how I dealt with it. And obviously, needless to say, took a toll on my confidence. On your confidence, is that what you think? Yes. Oh. obviously and, it's quite quite understandable and you were in you were in high school at this time uh, yes uh, class 11 class 11 and, and so these patches were all over your body or only in certain areas of your skin uh mostly in areas that are visible you know if you wear visible like the, your uh, hands and your hands hands face like face yeah yeah so so the the instant reaction i mean see uh, i can quite um, you know relate to the turmoil of a teenager uh, because teenage is actually a time when uh, a lot of hormonal changes are taking place teenagers are very conscious of how they look um, how they are perceived by others there's a there's a lot of confusion that goes on in the mind of, of a normal teenager and you know you uh, on top of that were dealing with this and uh, you know the, what you just described you know the kind of social stigma and people are pointing out saying that hey what is that on your skin um, you know not necessarily in a very comforting way but in a very uh, you know uh, in a way that makes you lose your self confidence uh, you know it's it's actually a very confusing time and you sometimes probably even went through this thing of uh, feeling that hey why is all this happening to me you know or, or why me did you i i think you may have felt you know what is this why can't it just go away and you know maybe you know you also felt a little bit of fear i don't know as to what is this am i going to have to live with this throughout my life uh, you know uh, those kind of uh, thoughts because teenage is typically a very a tough time for anyone and and you've not had it this uh you know uh, in any way so uh, did you go through those kind of uh, fear and and other things i think you must have yeah obviously i mean a few days ago i was going through a diary that i wrote when i was right. say 15 or 16 and the kind of things that i've written and i think oh my god like seriously why, why was i being so silly that's the kind of thought that i had in my head which is yeah obviously i thought i'm going to live with it but again you know if if it's today i'll be like yeah it's there so what i can still live with it i can still live a happy life with it but that is not the time and i would yeah, you you were so young at that time you know you were just uh, uh, you know you probably didn't didn't uh, realize and and you know from a from a stage of uh, okay this will go away you come to oh my god do i have to live with this all my life so you know so that 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 feeling kind of overwhelms you but i'm going to actually let avis uh, take this conversation forward and take your story forward yeah i have a question you, you talked about the diary so i i i i have a question there but before that i you know i i'm i'm just hearing you say that there was a lot of confusion there was uh, there was no diagnosis so generally i mean from an, uh, just to share some thoughts with the audience in general uh, any crisis when it, when it hits us uh, there there is um, every chance that uh, it will start from a point of uh, complete chaos uh, it will uh, there will be a lot of uncertainty a lot of clueless and uh, the nature of life is such that 
uh, we are always given problems that uh, we cannot immediately understand, fathom, or solve. Uh, so in Parvati's story, that's what I'm seeing, that uh, if you knew what it was, uh, you can address it. Uh, uh, you know, medically, you can address it emotionally. But if you didn't know what it was, uh, then uh, how do you deal with a problem that you, you can't even define at, at one time? And some of us, when we reflect on our own life journeys, you will find that you have either dealt with those kind of situations or are probably dealing with it right now, where uh, you, you're not able to put a finger on what is it and why is it in, uh, there for a long time. Now, the word crisis normally uh, lends itself to uh, immediate, urgent, resolute action as a uh, decisive action. Uh, but sometimes... There are situations in life, like Vani and I have discovered from our own experience, where the crisis kind of endures. Uh, the pain is there constantly. And uh, you're wishing it, you're fighting it, you're wanting it to go away, it does not kind of take it away. So it's a, it's a very um, uh, you know, a difficult phase when, when this happens. And that's what, what we learned, is that some phases in life cannot be solved or addressed with urgency. So uh, it can be done through reflection. You learn how to deal with the problem with reflection or uh, with meditative decision-making. And sometimes, uh, as we discovered, the, the very reason the problem is there in your life is to teach you faith and patience. So uh, I am picking up those, you know, those uh, thoughts uh, are coming to me when I'm listening to Parvati talk about her journey. Uh, but I want to go to that, go to that uh, diary. Uh, I want to go to those thoughts. I want to, I want you to go back to that point, Parvati. My question is, uh, you know, as we understood from your story, that when you told told us your story, somewhere for almost two years, for example, uh, when you were perhaps in grades um, uh, eleven and twelve in Kerala, uh, you, you you were studying there. Uh, you went through a treatment process that left you completely devastated from a self-esteem point of view. You uh, faced a lot of uh, stigma in those years from, uh, from your immediate circle and even from strangers. Uh, so uh, what, what did you, what, how, did you, how did you process these feelings? What did you write in that, in that diary? If you, you can like, just go, take us through your, your mental state, what you must have gone through at that time. Okay, before going to that, I think I should tell you a little about what this uh, treatment is, uh, treatment was. So, uh, yeah, this is when I was in class 11 and, you know, my principal recommended an Ayurveda doctor whom she knew. So, uh, initially everything seemed fine. He seemed to think that something was wrong with my liver. And he put me on this crazy diet where he deprived me of all good things in life. So I was, um, so I grew up in the Middle East and I'm a Malayali, so I eat a lot of meat. So to begin with, he asked me not to eat meat. And uh, obviously, I was a teenager, <laughs> child. I would want to eat, you know, ice creams and chocolates and potato fries. <laughs> so uh, basically, mine was a very very vegan diet, which is not by choice. That's okay. That is still bearable. Except the doctor was sort of, I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, no medical professional should be because he was very emotionally manipulative and he would play with the fears that my mother and I had. So, uh, he, as in, he would, and he would make these really mean comments about me, better follow my diet. Other, my diet and my medicine. Otherwise, nothing, nothing good's gonna happen to you. You might have to live with these patches. And oh my God, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen if you live with these, with, live these patches? Imagine the future. Maybe nobody will ma gonna marry you. And these are things that nobody should ever tell anybody. And uh, I had to hear these when I was 16 from a doctor. So this was emotionally very scarring. I could not, you know, I, I would have these really bad breakdown uh, episodes and 
I I and I couldn't even take so lays in food the food that I like because I was not allowed to eat it. So uh, if I think about it, those two years were really really bad, and I um I I don't know if that's that's probably one thing in my life that I want to change that you know. Uh, but um. So this went on from 2010 to 2012. So that was a very emotionally difficult period, period in my life. And uh, but thankfully, it ended in 2012 on one uh, one fine day uh, when oh okay. Also in 2012, I graduated from school and I went to college. so uh you know even then i was going through this ridiculous treatment and also my parents were paying an exorbitant amount of money to every time the price of the medicines magically increases so uh, uh i i i'm going to i'm going to just in, interrupt you here before you go forward in your story to college uh i, I was just listening to you and uh, i was i could feel the emotion I, even now it's raw and uh, i know you are feeling very emotional just reflecting uh, you know and sharing how you felt at that time um, and thank you for sharing that first of all uh, and this is uh, this is so so true about life um, there are people and there are instances that you can forgive but you can't forget uh, and uh, uh, you know as you grow older you learn to forgive people and learn to move on uh from instances that that pin you down but um you can't forget and, and, and in a way uh you, you need you need that um uh, that reflection to kind of make you stronger that's that's very important the uh it was you know just hearing you it was so difficult it's extremely difficult for me as a parent to hear and i you know if your parents are on uh, on this call right now listening to you share your story um i know it must have been very difficult for them as well Uh, what do you do when a when a practitioner uh, in a in a certain uh, line of uh, uh, you know uh, profession uh, lets you down? Uh, but that's the nature of life. That uh, when when you're going through one department is uh, is challenged, then many departments come crumbling. Uh, it 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 almost seems like a conspiracy. And uh, Vani and I have often found uh, social judgment. um you know uh people passing opinions unsolicited opinions you were talking a little while ago about how people would i mean out of concern sometimes but offer unsolicited opinions uh and that's um, that's something that we have dealt with also and we take we take solace in uh, in anand bakshi in uh, in the poet anand bakshi's lines uh, you know those my age will be able to relate to it uh, he wrote uh, these immortal lines for Am- amar prem Uh, made further immortalized by R. D. Burman, Kishore Kumar, and the lines were, "Kuch to log kahenge, logon ka kam hai kehna. Chhodo bekar ki baaton ko, kahi beat na jaye rehna." So people will say things, people will do things. It's their job to do it that way, say it that way. But leave, leave all this, you know, you know, nonsensical banter away. Bekar ki baat, uh, kahi beat na jaye. jaye rehna you know invest in the in the in the magic of the moment and uh, and uh, don't squander it away that's what the poet says uh, we we were told don't don't do this uh, i mean don't don't try to fix it only with logic your bankruptcy uh, fix it with religion fix it with ritual we were even recommended occult practices to drive away evil spirits that had befallen our family we we were told that um and we were also told uh uh you know to run away from chennai uh you know don't don't be here uh you run away hide somewhere for some years till things get better for you of course we did none of that uh, we finally found meaning in what a man uh, who is a siddha yogi uh, told us now the word siddha yogi may suddenly conjure up images for people listening to this conversation that uh, matted hair um rudraksh malay uh, orange robes a uh, flowing beard no this man had had none of those looks he was wearing a lungi 
he was wearing a um, um, you know a sleeveless vest which was torn in many places he was smoking a bd and he told vani and me uh, embrace your problem he said tamil la sonna he said unga kadana neenga nesikka aarambinga there is no word equivalent in english for nesikka so nesikka means gale lagalo pyar karo embrace your situation embrace your death adu ungalku edho solli kuduka virumbu trying to teach you something initially i i thought the man was crazy but over time i realized that the most precious form of wisdom had come from a man smoking a bd wearing a dungi wearing a sleeveless vest uh, standing in the hot sun in porur in chennai uh, he had given this piece of advice wisdom uh, to accept your problem to embrace your problem and, I, and you know we, i found it very very powerful um uh, and we have used this sense of acceptance this, this understanding of this acceptance uh, has helped us deal with uh, our 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 enduring crisis so i could relate to that that part of it very well uh, when you when you said um, you know almost choking uh, when you said how you felt uh, hearing all that and even thinking back about it. thank you it takes a lot of courage to say what you just said uh, i let vani Take, uh, take the, uh, you know, maybe Vani has the question on the... On yeah, the yeah, I have a question for Parvati. Uh, so this, obviously, this uh, so-called uh, natural uh, slash Ayurvedic, whatever, I don't know the, you know, definition of what treatment you were taking. But whatever the treatment was, A, it was expensive, B, it was not working. Clearly, it was not working on your uh, problem. and see it was it was affecting your self esteem it was debilitating you because as you said you could not uh, you you couldn't even seek comfort and food because you'd been banned from eating uh, you know things that you really loved to eat so how did you like finally break free from this uh, so called non working treatment if i may uh, you know and how did you finally come out of it and say okay i just want to get on with my life so how did that happen and and you were in your 12th and you were beginning to say that you were getting into college or whatever so tell us about that phase yeah so uh, 2012 all this was when i left home to go to jaipur to do my bachelor's degree so um, you know i was still taking the medicine following the diet this was in journalism and uh, journalism drug and english yes Yes. yeah so um it went on and at that time my parents were living in a different country they were living in qatar and right. uh for the diwali holidays i had gone to qatar to visit my mom and dad and uh tgif thank god it's friday that's one of our favorite family hangout spot so uh as as usual we'd gone there started eating and you know it's once in a while I'd break out I'd break these restrictions a little because I cannot resist the chatter crystals it's a potato and cheese dish so I was having that and all of a sudden I, I saw this um, I think it was southwest chicken or something so it was a batch of fried chicken in the menu so all of a sudden I had this really really bad training I really want to have this. What do I do? So, uh, mom was a little scared. Obviously, she didn't know what's going to happen. What, what if it backfires? And then my dad, you know, he was like, enough is enough. You've gone through it. You've gone through it all. If you, want, if you, want to, if, if you really want to have that chicken, go ahead and order. So then I, I, I was surprised. I said, so probably that's all that I needed in life. So... yeah i said okay i mean why not so he went ahead <laughs> ordered those chick- uh, chicken wings or chicken uh, i don't know that particular chicken dish and i had it happily then uh, that sort of how i came out of it and then when i went to my ask my dad look if i should i do i really have to continue taking these medicines he said if you want to leave it leave it's okay I mean, for how long can you, you know, 
stay away from things that you like. I said, ha, huh, okay, fair point. So, yeah, that was the end of it. So, 2012 Diwali was when life was almost back to normal. <laughs> right right and uh, so so you stopped not just uh, started eating whatever you felt like but you also stopped the medicines yes i also stopped taking those medicines you stopped taking those medicines yeah I, you know i i just feel that you come to a stage sometimes in life when uh, you know you just realize that okay enough is enough i just want to get on with my life and uh, nothing seems to be working uh, i just want to forget everything and move on you know uh, avis and i are very much uh, a very bollywoodish uh, family uh, i say this because uh, we talk a lot about uh, bollywood films and film songs and uh, we draw a lot of inspiration from bollywood uh, lyrics um, and especially the uh, the hindi i mean there are tamil songs and stuff that we relate to also but the uh, the hindi uh, lyrics are some yeah, some things that really give us a lot of inspiration and there's uh, one particular song that i'm actually reminded of uh, talking to you parvati and that's from a very old movie uh, you know it's a 1961 film called hum dono and it has a beautiful song uh, many people in the audience would know it's sung by mohammad rafi and uh, it goes uh, like you know main zindagi ka saath nibhata chala gaya har fikr ko dhuye mein udata chala gaya which means that you know i just went on with my life you know wherever my life took me i went on with my life and fikr actually means fears or worries or something like that so any fears or worries that i may have i'm just going to blow them away so that's what the the lyrics uh, go you know and talking to you right now i was actually just uh, thinking of that particular song because you come to a stage in life where you say okay i don't care what happens to this condition on my skin i don't care uh, what's going to happen i just want to eat what i want to eat and you know if if this treatment is not working and it's really not helping my skin heal then you know doesn't matter i'm just going on with my life and you just moved on and went on with your life and uh, i'm guessing you uh, finished your college and you you joined the new indian express after that is that how it happened uh yeah i graduated from amity with my bachelor's degree and then i went to bangalore to iit and to do a post graduate diploma And right that's after then 2016 was when i joined express so all this while uh, the the condition on your skin just remained yeah sort of because in between there was a phase where you know, we went to a cosmetologist who thought it was parasoriasis and i was taking the medicine for that but uh it worked a little maybe you know kind of um, a few patches disappeared like one or two but nothing major I sort of decided to live with it. I thought, right. no, that's the that 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 probably that's the way to go about it. <laughs> I I I have a, a I I want to talk a little bit about that phase of acceptance. But before that, let's uh, let me ask you a question, um, and, and then I'll ask you one more question. But uh, my question is, you know, you talked about writing a journal as a fifteen-year-old, and you you kind of went. and looked up that journal a few days ago you said and th- and at that time you you were you were confused you were uh, perhaps fearful you were uh, clueless about what was happening to you and also tired of that treatment that you were going through uh, and and all the social, social stigma so th- those must have been the uppermost emotion but jaipur bangalore uh, you you've taken a call not to go with that line of treatment anymore you stopped the medicine so you were in a state of acceptance So did you did you did you feel very differently about yourself in that way? Uh there were times when I felt very different about myself uh but there were times when I just did not care. So there were times when I would you know I really started enjoying dressing up 
And I also started making a lot of good friends. I mean, I had good friends in school. Obviously, I did. But, uh, you know, your friends in college, they, they're, they're really different. They are, they are very special. So uh, there were times when I celebrated myself. There were also times when I lost myself. So what would you do when you, when you lost yourself? Who would you lean on? Who would you, who would you call or uh, talk to? Mostly my mother. And what would she tell you? Uh, different thing. Mostly she would, she would try motivating me. She would tell me good things about myself. She would start praising me. And I am her only child. So I think she had a whole lot of time that day. So, you know, no other children to take care of. So, <laughs> that really it, helped. I know it must have been so difficult. Uh, so, the, the, so in, would, it, would I be right in saying that there was a phase when, uh, particularly in college between Jaipur and Bangalore, you, uh, you had the conviction that uh, you... Um, you're going to be unaffected by this, but there were also those low times when you when you needed to emotionally uh, look for support, and and mom came in there. Would, would that be a right summary? That is that is correct. Right. Yeah. You know, for uh, for for those in the audience, this is this is a very important phase in in life uh, when we are dealing with a problem. Uh, we, uh, we we often hear the word acceptance. You know. You, you talk about acceptance to anybody in, 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 around you, especially people that are older than you. And people will say, uh, like that Siddha Yogi told us, uh, you know, learn to accept your problem. Uh, only then can you solve it. Only then can you deal with it. Only then can you cope with it. But acceptance is such a, uh, you know, at one level, it seems like a very loose word. And at another level, it seems like, um, uh, uh, like, a, like a very definitive event. Uh, oh yeah, I have accepted it. Uh, it doesn't have to happen like that. Uh, it can be a very evolutionary process. So some people have the ability to accept a situation and say, okay, I'm done with this. It's over. Some people take time. And the way it works is it works with a lot of mixed emotions. And that's what we are hearing Parvati say. So there is the problem. So just imagine this, this is the problem. And slowly the emotions around the problem become bigger than the problem. So there is grief, there is anger, there is frustration, there is cluelessness. All of these are now because of this problem, but they're bigger than the problem. And only when the individual starts recognizing that all these emotions are debilitating, grief, anger, frustration, uh, or fear, all these are debilitating. And you let them go, you set them down, only then do you start looking at the problem uh, as something that you're going to cope with, that you're going to deal with. Until then, you're like asking why, why we, you know, we're going through all of that. So it's, it's, it works differently for different people. In Parvati's case, um, as I'm seeing it, it works um, very, uh, you know, dramatically, very interestingly at the TGIF. Uh, uh, meal with her family where she just you know let let herself go and ha enjoy that meal and her dad supported her uh, and the family supported her and then but then the, the mind kept going back to uh, the, the challenges uh, around the problem that she was coping with. That's how it really works. Life is not so easy. You, you take it one step at a time and you learn to cope with it. So uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you, um, uh, at what point did um, Parvati, did you actually uh, then go to diagnose this? I mean, how did that happen? I mean, you, you were, you kind of accepted it, it was there, and then uh, you, 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 you have a diagnosis come your way, and the diagnosis uh, is not a word that you want to hear, it's this cancer. So there was a new reality you were going to deal with. How did you a process that we are in. How did you cope with it? Okay, so 2016 was when I moved to Chennai. At this time, I was pretty sure that you know, nothing can be done about these patches and I'm going to live the rest of my life with it. But uh, 
you know, I think change of cities really helped because I found, I, I was just very happy here. I think this is one place that makes me very happy. So people here, um, you know, Chennai, yeah, people here were very accepting and very non-judgmental than others I've seen throughout my life. So I joined my workplace, which I really liked. And which is probably why I'm still there <laughs> five and a half years later. Then I like my colleagues, my team, my work, everything was going good. So basically there was no time to think about these factors. But again, you know, there would be those moments. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so sometime in 2016 was when I made a really, really good friend at work. Uh, her name is Jasper. So she, um, so, you know, and she was always like a rock. So uh, whenever I had issues, I would like go and talk to her, ran, went, everything. So, just, so uh, obviously I've shared this issue with her and she suggested that I go to a particular dermatologist who, whom she had gone to at one point in, life, a point in time and, you know, helped her get rid of the problem that she had. So I thought, why don't you, let me give it a shot? And I went to this doctor. Uh, so initially, you know, she seemed to be somebody that you rude and straight to the point. To the point. So um, straight away, she said that she wants to take a biopsy. So this freaked me out because I've only heard of biopsy being done for cancer. So, but then, you know, obviously you've got to find out what this is and find the solution. So, uh, oh, yeah, then the biopsy happened after that. She didn't seem quite happy with the biopsy uh, result. I mean, she had this frown on her face and she was like, you know, I think you should go for another test. So I'm like, okay, another test. So I go to the hospital with the prescription. Uh, but a friend of mine got them. So uh, who... Is my class, my school classmate. So uh, I did not understand a word that was written in my biopsy report. So I thought, uh, but I obviously am curious to know what it is. So uh, I took a pic. I so Gautam's sister is a doctor. So I asked him to take a picture of my report and send it to his sister because um, and to you know help uh, ask her what this exactly means. And then the the second test that we uh, that I had to do that was very expensive for some reason, and at that point I didn't have that much cash in my um, in my in, in my account, the account for which I was using the debit card. So I was really surprised. So obviously I had a friend to help me out with that time. So that also was quite surprising. So uh, gave my samples for the test. I came to my office, got them into his office. So in the evening, he gives me a call. And he's like, dude, I sent your reports to my sister. And I'm like, huh, then? And then he was, he just sounded very gloomy, very dull, which is so unlike him. Because he was this very happy, cheerful person all the time. So I'm like, dude, what happened? What's wrong? He said, no, but, uh, you know, just be very patient. I mean, nothing to worry. We're all there for you. I'm like, yeah, tell me what's, the, what's happening. He said, you may have to see other doctors apart from dermatologists as well, is what I think. And I'm like, dude, what are you saying? What do I have? Are you saying that I have to go to an oncologist as well? And weirdly, he didn't know who an oncologist is. He said, what is an oncologist? Then? I said, an oncologist is a doctor who treats cancers. And he was silent. So I was like, Gotham, where are you? What happened? Why are you silent? Say something. And he was like, uh, dude, that's what is written. But, you know, my sister said, nothing to worry. Let the other test results come. I did not know how to react I, because that wasn't what I expected. I had no idea that this was going to be something cancerous. So I, I, I just couldn't, I, so I immediately, I, I told him that I'll call him back and I immediately called up Jasmine. 
and she started con- uh, consoling me she was like you do not worry it it will be fine and then i had a, i had a couple of other people who were around me at that time who were consoling me and you know the final conclusion was to what not to tell my parents second thing wait for the result the ihc result a week later we got the ihc result and it was confirmed that it was a lymphoma a cancer so <clears throat> that is how i got to know about it must have been you were, you were alone in chennai you were living alone in chennai away from your family um, yeah. thank you for sharing this you know this is you know people this is this is a uh, you know a, a story which uh, all of us experience this in our own ways uh, when when uh, 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 an uncomfortable reality has to be confronted uh, we've heard many people tell their stories but parvati you uh, you know um, thank you for sharing it with such um, you know uh, integrity in a sense you know you were able to walk us through those moments that's why i didn't even step in and ask you anything uh, you there was there was so much truth there was so much raw emotion i i have i am i'm finding it uh, hard to find words here um, uh, the humanness of that moment was very apparent to us um, how did you uh, then take it to your family how did you communicate to your family that uh, you have this situation and how did you tell them or, or, or did you look for support from them or did they look for support from you to be able to deal with it? uh so uh, when i got the results i um so the senior colleague at work so she she was the only, so i went to work and she was the only one there and i asked her what to do so she said that it i don't think it's a good idea to not tell your friends you now so i was really confused really worried about how my parents would take it because begin with i am their only child who was living in a different country all by herself and they um and they're also growing old so i should consider all of those factors and then i thought maybe i should actually <clears throat> you know consider telling them so i called up my father he said dad i have something to tell you he said yeah what happened okay <clears throat> the other day i went to meet a dermatologist who asked me to get a biopsy and then she asked me to get another test so i have the test results with me and they don't look so good she said forward them to me if you have them in your mail forward them to me i forwarded it to my dad who in turn sent it to a friend of his who also happens to be an oncologist so um i mean right after i sent him obviously i was uh, i just wasn't able to concentrate on anything because i had these all thoughts of scary uh, emotions going on inside my head because to me cancer was that i didn't know what the intensity was and i was so stupid to go and google all the terms that i saw so google obviously told me that i'm going to die in the next 10 years so i was prepared to die and you know <laughs> then i've heard about how difficult law sessions are so i was ready for all sorts of consequences then that evening at around 5 o'clock i get a call from an unknown number uh that was my dad's friend who is an oncologist who said hi i am so and so person and your dad's friend we met when you were a child I said ha ha okay he said see it is a reality that it is a cancer but uh <clears throat> your diagnosis your reports do not look very bad so and i am somebody who meets people who are dying because of cancer every day and trust me you don't have to meet somebody like me you are not going to be treated by somebody like me you are dermatologist who self is capable of treating you so that was very comforting very comforting because again you know <laughs> in my head i was like almost prepared to die in the next 10 years then i was like oh okay i'm not going to die in the next 10 years so back to that but <clears throat> it gave me a lot of uncertainty because 
there's so much that you can convey through a phone conversation. I I want to know what's going to happen, how my life will look like, how things will be. Uh, and a couple of days later, I went to my dermatologist. She looked at my results and she said, "Part of it is and cancer, right?" <laughs> she said, "Wait, how do you know?" I said, "Well, of course, I googled, and Google told me that I'm going to die in the next ten years." She said, "And do you really think that you will die in the next ten years?" I said, "No, because I spoke to a family friend who's an oncologist, and he told me no." I said, "You know what? You deserve it because." Doctors are here to explain you what's written in your report. And who asked you to go and Google every every single thing that you see? So yeah, <laughs> that sounds fair. Uh, then she walked me through uh, the procedure, which apparently is quite simple considering the magnitude of the issue. It is <clears throat> one I did not have to go through any of the chemo sessions at all. I only have to go through. ultraviolet therapy i just have to let light fall on my skin which basically takes uh say half an hour of my time in a day and i got to do it twice a week that's all that i have to do she walked me through the process it was all good and every year i have to get a biopsy to see what the situation is and and you know take a series of other tests just to ensure that everything is all right so uh i mean her words were very comforting and also she was very sweet to assure me that you know do not worry because these things on your skin they are completely curable it's just um the skin it's just the lymphoma manifesting itself you're not going to live with it but again at that time i was in a better mind space because even if i were to live with it for the rest of my life i wouldn't have my i i would not have had a problem with it mm. but you wanted to, you 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 overcame that fear of death did you uh i did i did i did overcome but again there were it wasn't easy to be honest because um i mean now i can summarize it in say a couple of minutes but it wasn't exactly that day because even before that i had i had to go through a few scans <clears throat> i had to go through something called a pet ct scan where they scan your entire body from top to bottom and you know supposed to eat anything on that day and have crazy after effects you go on puking for the next two days then and going through all of this all alone <laughs> you know in in city did, did 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 cause cause you uh to to kind of consider that uh that something was going to go wrong horribly wrong sorry i, I didn't get that oh, going through all of this all alone sometimes did lead you to think that you you had to go something would go horribly wrong uh, uh not really but you know i was uh terribly in need of a support system I, you were in I, need of uh, we'll come to that we'll come to that in a moment but Uh, i just want to talk about how uh, you know uh, just look at parvati everyone uh, here is a here is someone who thought she was going to die uh, here is somebody who thought uh, that there was no way forward and perhaps chemotherapy was going to uh, you know uh, um, you know kind of uh, burner burner out completely uh, that's what chemotherapy normally is known to Uh, at least those are the perceptions that people have and uh, here she is um, a few years later telling us the story to me the, the biggest takeaway here is there is a lot of life through a crisis and after a crisis and therefore when we are hit with a situation that we cannot immediately deal with uh that that makes us fearful that makes us um you know cover in fear uh we uh, must recognize that uh, there is a lot of life after uh, a crisis and even through a crisis one part is the learning that you all that you learn through a crisis and the other part is after the crisis like uh, you know parvati here uh, talking about the entire journey 
So that's what I'm picking up. The other thing is about fear of death itself. I think um, uh, death is uh, death. Death uh, does not, you know, should not necessarily be feared. Uh, it must be understood. It's an integral. Uh, Davis, we lost you. Oh, you lost. You lost me. Is there an internet problem? Okay. Hello, Avis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One second. Uh, it is there, but uh, what? Uh, yeah, he's back. Uh, it is we lost you in between, so uh, I'm actually going to go and ask Parvati uh, something. Uh, Parvati, yeah. this uh, this treatment, uh, you know, the, the therapy that you were undergoing, the ultraviolet therapy that you were going through, actually transformed you, uh, you know, and and also you spoke about. Uh, the fact that you needed support. So, wh what was your coping device? I mean, tell us a little bit about how you cope with all of this, and uh, did you at all use faith as a coping device? Um, so, it was mostly people whom I met here because mm -hmm. I, um, I mean, this journey wouldn't have been this smooth if I hadn't had these two amazing friends with me, Jasmine and Gautam, and. My boss was very supportive, uh, Daniel. So there was this time when I had to go for the, the PET CT and they had specifically said that, you know, a bystander has to be with you. And my parents were not here. And um, at that time, Daniel said, that's okay, I can be a bystander. Said, what, really? He said, yeah, I mean, you need somebody to be with you to take care of you, I can do that. So that was really sweet of him. I don't know anybody who's had a boss who done that to them. Then uh, many times Jasmine's mom has come with me for these appointments, especially when I went to an oncologist to get the get. Uh, I mean, I had to meet an oncologist once just to you know get make sure everything is fine. So the minute she heard that, she said, "No, you're not going for that alone. I'm going to come with you. Your mom's not there with you. I'm here. Don't worry about it." So. I mean, and this was around the time when, so uh, Jasmine's mother, she doesn't speak a lot of English. She mostly speaks Tamil. And at that time, I did not speak Tamil at all. And still we had like long conversations while we were driving to, you know, different hospitals and, and diagnostic centers and everything. Fate, uh, I mean, to, not exactly, I'm not, a, I'm not somebody who, uh, who is very religious and I'm not somebody who prays a lot. I used to pray only before my exams or term paper presentations. So, mm -hmm. so uh, this time, and thirdly, I, I remember when I was, say, 16 or 17, I had conversations with my dad. I would say that, you know, I want to I want to live only till 40. Mm -hmm. By 40, I would have done everything that I want to do in life. And then after that, I can die. It's still, I'll die young. So <laughs> my dad would laugh and he said, okay, I'm not at all surprised because when I was as old as you, I would think that I want to die when I'm 30. And when I was 30, I had you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then the time when I got my diagnosis, I would, that one week between... Uh, you know, the time Gautam had a conversation with his sister and I had a conversation with the oncologist. But that time I would think, I would replay these conversations in my head. I would think that I was very, I was really stupid. Now I sort of get, you know, things that my, uh, I, I, I sort of get, my, get what my dad says. Because that's when you realize that there are people around you who care about you, who love you, and who's going to who are going to miss you when you're gone? And you wouldn't want to live for them. You'd want to do uh, more things. You would want to see your parents grow old. You would want to do new things in life and see where life takes you, maybe. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I was so young. I wanted to do more things in life. I wanted to expose more scams and write about politicians and get, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, do a lot, do a lot more things in my journalistic career. Meet new people, have a have a life, have a happy life, have people around, make more friends, travel. So many things that I wanted to do. So I would think about all that, and surprisingly, I prayed a couple of times. 
Let's you go did. to a temple or a church or something. But, you know, I would just close my eyes and pray to some power. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. You know, what you have done is actually a very courageous thing. You know, telling people, it's, you know, putting your life on your sleeve. Uh, it requires a lot of courage. And Avis and I have experienced this as well, you know. Uh, putting your life on your sleeve actually attracts a lot of human kindness and compassion towards you, which I think happened to you, your colleagues, your friends, your, um, you know, family, uh, all came forward and supported you. And one more thing I, I, I want to highlight here is that the human spirit, uh, you know, irrespective of what, you know, the human spirit is such that it learns to bounce back, uh, you know, and, you, the different people use different devices, like you said. Uh, some people use faith as a device, some people use friendship, some people use love, some people use different things, art. Uh, some people use art as a coping device. So different people use different things to cope with what they're going through. But um, everything said and done, I think uh, it's very courageous of you to have written that first person account in the New England Express. And uh, tell everybody what you're going through because this, this, while it made you vulnerable, um, it also attracted a lot of kindness uh, and uh, you know a lot of uh, you know support coming your way. So I think that is great. Yeah. Uh, Parvati, am, am I now audible? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. You yeah. Are. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about this piece that uh, you wrote that actually made. Vani and me sit up and take notice of your story. Uh, Vani did talk about the courage aspect, but I'm asking a deeper question. Uh, how did you get that courage uh, to, 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 to tell it all in that story? So uh, it all began on this particular day when, uh, so during my younger days when I was in my teenage, I was very conscious about the clothes that I wore. So this particular day, I had a kutta, a sleeveless kutta, which I wore to work. And I thought that I looked really beautiful. So I, I also had a couple of people tell me that I looked really good that day. So uh, that day, that evening, I'd gone out with a few friends from work and a friend had click, uh, clicked the picture of mine. So uh, I was looking through the picture and I was, I was just... I could recollect, you know, if, if, if this is me from a few years ago, I wouldn't have worn what I'm wearing right now. That sort of inspired me to write, to, you know, put that up on Facebook, put that picture up on Facebook and write a little about the journey, about what I've gone through. I put it up on Facebook and Instagram. Um, so that... I, I, I don't know, it, it, it sort of blew up and a lot of people started liking and sharing, commenting, <clears throat> messaging me saying, oh my God, we had no idea that this is what you were going through. Uh, so Rama, the editor of City Express was one of the people to read it and she asked me if I could write this as a little more elaborate piece for City. And that's how it all happened. I said, why not? I mean, if it's if, and if it can, if it can, you know, help a few people, then what's stopping you from doing that? And that's how it happened. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to come to a, one last question, and a, you know, the absolute last question for the evening for a sharp answer. But we are, you know, I'm keeping a close watch on time. But you know, two important points here. One uh, is I was talking about the idea of death, and uh, you know, when we are confronted with the idea of death, it's always scary always seen as, a, as, as an inevitable end uh, to the journey. But uh, death was never a surprise because I think anybody who's born um, uh, will die. Uh, you know, and that's the truth about, about, about the process of life. Uh, so death needs understanding. What, what happens with a situation like what, what you have been through, um, Parvati, is that uh, yeah, the, the, uh, in, the inevitability of death the uh, you know the the, uh, the fact that it is it is just there in front of you uh, that kind of stares you in the face and that transforms your perspective to life 
that's uh, that's what perhaps uh, you know led you to that point where you you believed in celebrating yourself on with that facebook post uh, so these are these are uh, you know subconscious uh, you know feelings that grow within us and express ourselves today as you know the, 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 you know we express ourselves a lot on social media and you did precisely that but the essence of your expression is celebrating yourself and that uh, is what manifested in the form of that uh, that article that appeared in chennai express and then you're here telling your story today uh, you know this this is the process of life we all go through this journey uh, only so that we learn we evolve and you're so young to have uh, learned all these um, uh, through through a very very uh, enduring long painful experience that's uh, uh, so you become in my opinion you become stronger you become wiser and you look uh, a lot more in your skin you look a lot more comfortable in your skin uh, amazing my last question for the evening keep it sharp uh, maybe a minute two minutes uh, how has this entire experience changed your outlook to life and your idea of happiness uh, how has it has it brought about any change at all uh, and if so how um, okay there, there were points where i was absolutely hopeless in uh in my life but that's not where i am right now i'm in a much better space i uh slowly started discovering new things in life and i um i would so what do you say so i uh still don't know what defines happiness for me but every day i look forward to do, to doing something new and this this is not this this was not the person who i was maybe a decade ago i'm 27 now at 17 i was exactly the opposite of this i look forward to meeting new people i look forward to doing new things and even after that particular article that i wrote in city express i have had so many people reaching out to me because they have been diagnosed with ms and in india the treatment for ms uh, it's not very uh, not it's not very popular not a lot of people know whom to go to and what sort of treatment to get so the, um, in fact a couple of weeks ago somebody had reached out to me through linkedin because they wrote, they read the piece and they wanted to know what to uh, you know where to go and what to do so that way i and i made a few i mean so some people have had like long conversations and um they've <clears throat> had each other wishing for you know birthdays and new year or something so that that is kind of nice that that i mean that with with this life i was able to you know help at least a couple of people just by existing so <laughs> i think you you uh, in in your own charming way you kind of summarize the essence of life the reason why we uh, you know is there a reason why we go through experiences in life absolutely yes do we know the reason when when we are going through it no we always reflect on it in hindsight and um uh for vani and me we are who we are today uh, because of our bankruptcy we are the happiness walas we have understood the the essence of life is to be happy despite your circumstances not to postpone your happiness this learning came because of our enduring bankruptcy in your case your evolution your awakening your uh, your ability to touch lives has happened to you because of mf because of my course is going and uh, that is uh, you know that is perhaps the, uh, it's a blessing it's the perhaps the sacred reason divine reason if i can call it for why you went through what you went through the good news is ladies and gentlemen that the cancer is in remission for a couple of years now and uh, the bigger news the bigger story of the evening for me uh, as i as i kind of wind this conversation down and trying to collect my thoughts and summarize what we have picked up from parvati but the big story for me of the evening if you if you followed this uh, you know the conversation 
that we were having and the pictures that came up on the screen. Um, and Parvati, uh, whenever she presented, she was beaming her famous smile. Her smile has remained intact through this journey. It's just the same. And that is the big story. That's the blessing. Uh, she's not bitter from the experience. Uh, she is um, still uh, full of positivity, uh, full of life. And uh, that is because, uh, as I see it, she's gone with the flow of life. You know, it all started at the age of seven. She's 27 now. Uh, 20 years is a long time in somebody's life to endure a, endure a problem. And uh, Parvati has been through all of that uh, without any bitterness. And that's, uh, that's the power of your story, Parvati. That's the power of your journey. And that's what I want to take away. Um, I started with Javed Akhtar, so I'll go back to Javed Akhtar to kind of close the evening. Javed Akhtar, this time I'll, I'll go to Zindagi Na Milegi Dopa, another favorite film of mine. Uh, I'm sure many people in the audience can relate to this. Uh, Javed Akhtar wrote these lines for Zindagi Na Milegi Dopa. Ye jo gehre sannate hai, wakt ne hum sab ko baante hai. Thoda gham hai sab ka kissa. Thodi dhub hai sab ka hissa. Aank teri बेकार ही नम हर पल एक नया मौसम क्यों तू ऐसे पल खोता है दिल आखिर तू क्यों रोता है दैट्स व्हाट ही रोड बेसिकली ही मी ही ही इज पॉइंटिंग टू द फैक्ट दैट द डार्कनेस दैट इंगल्फ्स अस इज डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड यूनिफॉर्मली टू एवरीवन बाय टाइम एवरीवनस गॉट अ स्टोरी ऑफ पेन एंड एवरीवनस गॉट दिस स्पॉट इन द सनशाइन इन द in the uh, you know their share of sunshine a spot in the limelight uh, every moment is a new season why are your eyes moist why are, are are you squandering this moment why are you crying dear heart that's what the poet writes and he says that um, from the point of view that we must not postpone happiness because we are dealing with a problem but we must understand the nature of life and flow with it and i think that's what you have done for us and it's amazing thank you so much for being here with us this evening and sharing your journey um on behalf of vani and me i'll i'll share our screen uh we leave you with a um, virtual um uh, you know a, a virtual token of uh, our love uh, let me share my screen one second yeah um thank you that's that's the button that you will hear on happiness conversations to share your story so uh, you know wear it on 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 your social media handles and uh, you know spread the cheer look at her smiling at us in that picture this is what i meant the ability to flow with life and to retain that uh, retain that smile so thank you parvati for for being with us and for sharing thank you for having me today thank you uh, for sharing your uh, story parvati that was uh, you know very courageous of you and uh, you know to to be vulnerable in front of people is not easy yes it's not easy uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, as i as i close the evening i want to uh, make an announcement that uh, we will uh, be taking a reflective pause vani and i for the next four months um, uh, november december january and february and we will start the uh, eighth season the eighth year of the avis pani curations Uh, for our conversations list catchers and happiness conversations uh, in march 2022 uh, we just want to take a step back and see what we are doing and how we can do it better the pandemic is almost winding to an end hopefully and so we would like to review things like what kind of format uh, on on zoom uh, how are we going to do it if you would like to register for our conversations uh, please do um, uh, you know reach out to us on instagram or uh, to our website and we'll be happy to have you thank you so much everyone um, wonderful evening and uh, those in the audience thank you for joining us thank you Bye.